We're here today with Associate Professor Sarah Ferber and she wrote an interesting book called Bioethics and Historical Perspective and today we're going to talk to her about that. Thanks for coming Sarah. Thanks Jane. So you said lots of interesting things in your book. Um, one of the main things I found interesting was your the history of euthanasia and especially well the first thought that comes to my mind is um, what you think people misunderstand it based on the history of the Nazis and their incorrect use or using the word of euthanasia. Yeah, I think that, that the Nazi euthanasia campaign, which if your viewers aren't aware of that history, one of the ways in which um, the Hitler regime developed was through introducing policies of what was called euthanasia but was in fact just the killing of uh, people in mental homes, for example. Um, on the basis of the, the idea, in inverted commas, that they were useless to society. And I think when we have a euthanasia debate today, generally people aren't thinking in those terms. They're thinking about the right to choose your own way of having your life end, and usually in consultation with a medical practitioner in your family. So they're two very different things. So what sometimes happens though is that when you have uh, someone who opposes euthanasia very vehemently. They can invoke the Nazi example and say, "Oh, you're just like uh, you're just like the Hitler regime." When in fact, in most instances, modern debates about euthanasia really aren't about um, Hitler-type euthanasia. So that reminds me of the point that you made about Leo Alexander, yes. and he's at the slippery slope yeah. and the small changes in. Their mo in people's moral structure could lead to stuff like that and that comes to even today with Obamacare and the health reforms in America people are afraid of it leading to stuff like that. Yeah. But um, do you think that um, that's a wrong way to look at it or do you think you know? I think the problem with the slippery slope argument I don't think there's any question that that people's consciousness of what's going on around them can become in different contexts kind of softened up and you kind of you can let your moral guard down without knowing it. I mean I think that in itself it's not an unreasonable thing to say but I think when you use a slippery slope argument you have to be very aware of the context and make realis realistic judgments about whether a particular, a particular cultural context is likely to permit an absolute disaster um, along the lines of, of what t took place under the, the Nazi regime. And I think what I try to argue in the book is that you need to nuance. If you're going to use terms like slip slippery slope, you have to look very carefully at examples, um, real examples, to say, well, is this really what happened? Is this really, for example, in the Netherlands, is really what is happening in the Netherlands now, which you, the Netherlands has been uh, a, a leader in thinking and in public action about euthanasia for uh, more than 30 years. Is that really similar to what happened in the Nazi regime? Or has their slippery slope, if there is one, uh, taken a, a different form? So I think you, I think it's, I'm a historian and I'm troubled by the idea that you can use historical examples in a lazy fashion. It's much more important to try and get the facts and make your appraisal of a situation on the basis of the facts rather than a kind of hysterical anxiety. So what type of situation do you think we'd have in moral society if it wasn't for using historical perspective as a way to sort of move away from those things? That's a really good question. It's, it, history doesn't, doesn't tell you all the answers because we can't predict what's going to happen. Um, but if you go to the other extreme and say, well, what's it, what's a, what is a culture or a society like with no memory whatsoever? with no sense of moral orientation on the basis of what's happened in the past, then you have a society that is ill-equipped to think about the possible implications of change now. So it doesn't mean that you can hold up the mirror of the past and say, therefore, this will or won't happen again. It's just, it's just a way of forming a language for speaking about moral issues and talking about the past is one of the ways that you can create that language. Australia was also one of the first countries, was the first country to legalise euthanasia in the Northern Territory in 1995, but it was quickly, can't, it was quickly ended by the Howard government in the mm -hmm. federal court. Yes. Now, in the, um, in the federal, in the federal parliament, yep. sorry. And um, so what do you think, do you think it was a mistake 
ending it or and do you think should we revisit that topic? Uh, it, I think it is regularly discussed in different jurisdictions in Australia so in a way I think going back to what you said before it is something for your generation as well. It is still debated uh, whether or not there should be federal law about euthanasia, whether states should be allowed to make laws um, allowing for for physician assisted suicide those still are issues that are very much on on the agenda but they come and go the reason it was huge news in the 1990s was because there was actually a jurisdiction where it was legal briefly legalized and as you said it was uh, made illegal by an act of parliament in which politicians from both sides uh, with particular moral perspectives that weren't related to their party allegiance they voted um, and that meant that the Northern Territory legislation was no longer valid and so there could be no more physician assisted suicides in the Northern Territory. That's in a way, that was the high point of public debate but it is still being debated for example in Western Australia I think. Um, I think it's also been debated in the ACT but at the moment there are no jurisdictions in Australia where, where it is legal but it doesn't mean that that won't be on the agenda um, for you know for some years to come. So tell us about what you think about the, well, mainly the historical um, impact of eugenics on society. Uh, eugenics was a social and political movement that pretty much swept the world uh, fr from the early 20th century right into the 1930s and even beyond, uh, even into the 1950s in some ways. The principle behind eugenics was what's called her a hereditarian principle, the idea that if you control what kind of people are allowed to procreate, you will get a better society. That was the principle behind eugenics. And medicine came into that uh, because a number of because with this was also a time when early genetics was emerging and so now we have very sophisticated uh, medical genetics which again some critics see as being similar to eugenics because it's about selecting who is suitable to be born. That's the argument that's raised so the eugenic analogy is regularly brought into conversations about modern genetic technology uh, with greater or lesser ap applicability uh, depending on the, on, the, on the question at hand. One of the things about eugenics was that it was very, and, and obviously Hitler's euthanasia campaign was informed by eugenics, eugenic attitudes that people for example with uh, mental, with intellectual incapacity of some kind uh, or even extreme disability that could be attributed to heredity um, that such people should not be allowed to be born or not be allowed to reproduce um, and also criminals. Criminality was seen as hereditary in a very kind of black and white way. Uh, there's much more nuance around that debate now even though it's still being researched. So eugenics um, particularly with uh, involuntary sterilization that was probably the the most dramatic impact of eugenics certainly from a medical point of view uh, that took place um, particularly in Nazi Germany but also in the United States of America. Many states in the USA uh, required uh, sterilization of men and women who were deemed to be unfit to reproduce. Uh, so it is a very disturbing history but whether or not that history is wholly applicable to the kind of genetic research that goes on now is very much a, de a debated point because I think um, again a, a bit like the Nazi analogy if it's if it's overused and used without nuance then there's no point in making a historical comparison. Uh, you said in your book that you think it should be used only as a historical for historical background but not for a direct comparison. Do you think there's too much of a direct comparison? There can be, there can be way, there can be too much of a direct comparison in a way that, that leads, it's, it's intended to shut down debate rather than open up debate and I think one of the things that I try to do in my book is talk about ways of using uh, informed argument rather than just a kind of knock down argument, oh that's eugenic, well you can't do it. Uh, things are much more complex than that and uh, contemporary genetics is a, is a huge area and I think it's worth 
discussing different cases in, in more detail rather than assuming that everything again is going to end up uh, with invol involuntary sterilisation or some kind of dramatic impact. I think that, that modern reproductive genetics is a, is a huge area and there are some ethical, there are ethical concerns but uh, I think generally the argument that suggests that, that it's, it's eugenic uh, is an argument that should be taken with a grain of salt and only addressed using the facts. That's really interesting. I'm going to open this up to a wider question, if sure. that's okay. Yeah. Now you talk, well we've spoken about inf the impact of eugenics and Nazi ideologies. Mm. What were some of the other big historical impacts on our, bio on our ideas of bioethics? Probably human experimentation is another area where there's been a great deal of debate. Uh, certainly, and again I'm sorry to, to sort of go st straight back to the Nazi <laughs> question, but medical experimentation under the Nazis was a very dramatic example of um, completely morally unacceptable um, use of experimentation on human beings, but also uh, even going back to the late 19th century, the late 19th century, there was debate in the US and in England and indeed in Germany well before the Second World War. Uh, if you have a science-based medicine, which we do, often the data that you need has to come from a number of people who are not sick. So it means that you have to experiment. As long as you have a medicine that is built around those scientific principles, and of course from which we all benefit probably every day, then you instantly have an ethical issue. It's, so it's a historical ethical issue that has really been with us since at least the 19th century um, about experimentation on human beings um, and how far getting in good knowledge in inverted commas is necessarily good ethics and it's, it can be sometimes quite a delicate balance. So that's why we have things uh, like the, the ethics committee that I'm involved in at University of Wollongong. Uh, quite often we look at applications from researchers who want to uh, invite participants in their research project and so one of the things that the Australian Ethics Committee system does is embody conversation and appraisal of the risks and benefits of new research that's coming through. Uh, well, what impact does things like religion have on uh, thoughts of bioethics. Right, I'm really glad you asked that because I think it's kind of the sleeper issue uh, in a lot of bioethics. It's, it's very easy just to focus on <coughs> the nature of the, the undertaking, whether it's, it's research or it's a clinical treatment. Um, but in fact, religious perspectives in the euthanasia debate, for example, it's, they're huge. And I think uh, in the history of, of what, I mean bioethics itself is a new word. It's only been around since the 1970s. And really during that time, religious perspectives have informed a great deal of the, the debate. And of course, the one I haven't even mentioned is, is abortion and the importance of uh, a pro, well, anti-abortion sentiment in shaping ethical debate, uh, particularly around different sorts of reproductive intervention, uh, embryo experimentation, that's kind of become caught up in the same debate as the abortion debate and it's very intensely religious. Uh, so, and likewise euthanasia, you know, it's often people with strong religious views. Having said that, people who are religious from any number of perspectives are not always going to share the views of the people from the same religion that they have. So it can inform their desire to be involved in ethical conversations and to influence um, ethical debate and outcomes. But it doesn't mean that all Catholics or all Jews or all Protestants, and I deal mainly with the Western jurisdictions, so why I give those examples, uh, why all of those groups, they won't all necessarily have the same perspective just because they belong to the same group, but it still has coloured debate in a really important way. Not always bad, not always good, but it's a huge factor and I think uh, we, we, we pretend that we're a secular society and because the history of religion is, is where I come from, I'm very aware that we are not in a secular society. We're in a, in a society where religion in different ways plays a huge part 
and so that's one of the things that I, I've written about in the book as well. I think I'm going to finish this with one final question, sure. if it's okay. If there's one thing you wanted people to get from your book, what would that be? Uh, that's <laughs> thank you. Um, I think if, if, if someone reads the book and comes away thinking and having learned things that they didn't know and just reflecting and also reflecting about their own perspectives in their own lives because I think a number of the things that I talk about are you know, decisions that we all might have to face in different contexts, um, whether it's people who are involved in wanting to have children who want to think about what kind of um, genetic tests they might, might want to have or in relation to uh, euthanasia. If people have food for thought from reading my book, then I would be a very happy researcher. Oh, well, thank you for joining okay, us. Okay, no, thanks a lot. Good on you, Trent. I'm Trent Thomas. I'm here for Associate Professor Sarah Ferber, and this is UOW TV. Mm -hmm.